Okay, today I'm going to be placing a levitating globe in the vacuum chamber and seeing if it can spin forever. You can see that there's nothing around it. It's completely levitated. So what we're going to be testing is if I can spin this really fast, will it really spin forever in the vacuum chamber or is there something else that will slow it down? So I have here a green magnet and an orange one. So the reason that I can't stably levitate these on top of each other is not just because I'm bad at stacking them, but it's actually due to something that's been proved called Earnshaw's Theorem. Basically Earnshaw's Theorem proves that when you try to levitate two magnets on top of each other, they will always be inherently unstable in at least one axis. So they will always flip. Unless I restrain one axis, then it can levitate. So then how is this globe levitating? Well, it's levitating using maglev technology. And what it does is it uses permanent magnets in the base and in the globe, but it also has a feedback system. So it has electromagnets in it in addition to the permanent magnets. And what those electromagnets do is they have a feedback system that senses when it starts to get off balance and it pushes it back in balance. So this doesn't deviate from Earnshaw's theorem because it's not a static system meaning that there's continual feedback from the electromagnets inside of here. So that's how it can keep levitating. So this is a really cool piece of technology here. I'll put a link in my description where you can get it on Amazon if you want. And it's actually made to stably rotate a little bit because it's the Earth, so they wanted to show you that the Earth is rotating. So we're not gonna time it until it stops, but we're gonna time it until it gets down to this many revolutions per minute. Okay, so first, before we put it in the vacuum chamber, let's see how long it takes to start spinning at one and a half revolutions per second and then get down to a half a revolution per second. So I'm just gonna blow some air on it to start spinning and let's see how long it takes to get to a half a revolution per second. Okay, it's going about one and a half revolutions per second now. Let's start the timer and see how long it takes to get to a half a revolution per second. Okay, so it's going about a half a revolution per second now. It looks like it took around six minutes. So now let's see how long it takes in the vacuum chamber. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, we got a pretty good vacuum in there now. Let's see how long it can spin like this. Okay, now we're at around a half a revolution per second. So it's still slowed down even in the vacuum chamber. Okay, so it looks like there wasn't a big difference between in the atmosphere and in a vacuum on how long this was able to spin. So that means that the main resistance was not coming from the air, but due to something else. So as I said before, the globe works by using electromagnets that are keeping it balanced. So those electromagnets are continually in a feedback loop and that feedback loop essentially is creating a little bit of magnetic resistance. And so it's stilling some of the angular momentum of the globe as it spins as it tries to keep it balanced. So one thing that was different from our floating earth here in the vacuum chamber and the real earth in the vacuum is that this doesn't have air around it. But the question then arises, how come the vacuum of space doesn't suck the air off of the Earth? And it's a valid question. If you think about it, there's an atmosphere around the Earth, and then there's a complete vacuum outside of it. So why doesn't all of the air just rush off the Earth into the vacuum? And the answer to that is actually pretty simple. It's due to the gravity of the Earth that holds the air on. And it's easiest to understand this if you think of air as little tiny particles. And so all of these little molecules of oxygen and nitrogen in the air, they're all bumping around hitting each other. This is my molecule of oxygen, we'll say. And eventually they can migrate up to the top of the atmosphere. So let's say it gets all the way up to the top of the atmosphere and it gets bumped by another oxygen molecule and it flies up. But in order for that molecule to leave the earth, it has to be going faster than the escape velocity of earth. 
So the escape velocity happens because as you get further and further away from the Earth, the gravitational pull on the ball gets weaker and weaker and weaker, so that it will always have enough speed so that it will never return back to Earth. And that's called the escape velocity. So if you could throw a ball at the escape velocity, it would leave the Earth never to come back again. So the reason why you've never seen somebody throw a ball off the Earth is because the escape velocity of Earth is 11 kilometers per second. So around 33 times the speed of sound. So the regular molecules that are in our atmosphere, like nitrogen, oxygen, argon, they don't have enough velocity to escape the gravity of the Earth. But hydrogen, for example, does have a high enough speed to escape the Earth. So whenever you release hydrogen gas into the atmosphere, eventually it will migrate out to the edges of the atmosphere and it'll get bumped and it'll just fly off into space. So all the hydrogen leaves the Earth. And for that matter, actually all the helium also leaves the Earth. When you fill a balloon with helium, eventually all that helium will leave Earth. So if the Earth were much smaller than it is, then it wouldn't be able to keep the atmosphere on it because the escape velocity would be much slower. And that's why the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, because it's much smaller, it has only one-sixth the gravity of the Earth, and so the escape velocity is much slower, lower than the speed of the oxygen or the nitrogen atoms, so they can easily escape from the moon. So space is almost a perfect vacuum, and the Earth is going to be spinning for a very, very long time but eventually it will slow down. So when the moon rotates around the Earth, it pulls on the Earth a little bit unevenly, and that's what causes the tides on the Earth to form. And because of those tidal forces, it slows down the Earth's rotation just a little bit, and the moon gets a little bit further away from the Earth. So as the moon moves away and the Earth slowly slows down its spin, after a few hundred billion years, the length of the day of the Earth will be around 47 current days. And then the moon and the Earth will become tide-locked. And what that means is that the face of the Earth and the face of the moon will always be facing each other. Right now, the moon is already tidal-locked with the Earth. So that's why we always see the same face of the moon, because it's orbiting at the same rate that it's rotating, so that it always faces the Earth. But way before the Earth and the Moon become tide-locked like that, the Sun is eventually going to start burning out. And as it does, it's going to expand and eventually engulf the Earth in about 5 billion years from now. Hey everyone, thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions about this video or any comments or suggestions, let me know in the comments section and I'll try to get to them. And for anybody that's fluent in Spanish and you're having a hard time understanding the English in these videos, I created a new separate channel called the Action Lab in Espanol. So basically, it's my channel, but in Spanish. And you won't get to hear my awesome voice, but it will be voiced over in Spanish, so it'll help you understand it a little bit better. But thanks for watching again, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.